Good afternoon and welcome to the premiere episode of our new series, Voice of Supply Chain. Following the program, we will be sending you a copy of the recording along with your uh, continuing education for today's attendance. Please be sure to use our Q&A or the chat function if you should have a question. I will now turn the program over to our series host, Sarah Scudder, president of Real Sourcing Network. Thank you, Kathy. I am so excited to kick off our Voice of Supply Chain series. This is something that Kathy approached me about a couple months ago, and she knows I'm a big believer in storytelling, and I think there's so much power and energy that we can learn from each other by hearing stories. So I was super excited about the series idea, and she asked me to kick it off, and I said, under one condition, I want to have Genty as our first guest. Okay. So Genty is here with me today. Her and I both live in the San Francisco Bay Area, and we're enjoying actually some beautiful weather today, which is really nice. She has an absolutely adorable dog. So we, we maybe we'll get a, a guest appearance um, by the dog today. Genty and I actually met last year at a conference called Spark here in San Francisco. We never actually spoke in person at the conference, but we saw each other. And then a month or so after, Genty did this really powerful post on LinkedIn talking about her story and how she made it to the United States and overcame so many things in her life to become a chief procurement officer. And I was so touched by her story that I reached out to her on LinkedIn and said, we have to be friends. So since then we've evolved and had this incredible friendship over the last 12 months. So it is such an honor uh, to be interviewing Genty today. And I want this to be interactive. So feel free to use the chat function to post comments or notes. We also have the Q&A function running. So if you have specific questions about um, something that Genty talks about or something that I, I don't bring up today, feel free to put that in. Genty's a, a really open book and has some incredible stories to share with us. So with that, Genty, I wanna, I wanna start off the conversation today talking a little bit about your childhood because I think your childhood had such a big impact on why you came to the United States and, and why you did the things you did. So what was the most impactful childhood memory? Thank you, Sarah. And before I talk about my childhood, I wanna say how happy I am to have this conversation with you today because last February, when we were at the Spark Conference and Dr. Louise and all of you women were bustling out everywhere. I was watching from the background and I was like, this girl, she has such a spark in her life. I can feel it and I won't go talk to her. And I kept chasing you everywhere because your jacket, your newspaper jacket was so <laughs> attractive. But every time I got close to you, everybody was walking around you and talking. So I missed the opportunity. But to have my very first virtual interview with the person I was chasing, I feel pretty honored. So thank you for that. <laughs> well, Jenty, well, so normally I'm wearing newspaper print since I run a startup in the procurement space. So we help yeah. companies manage their print spends. But today yeah. um, I'm wearing a very special jersey. So we'll get to that later in the interview. Sure. Okay, so now talking about my childhood, you know, all of us remember our childhood in one way or the other. And mine was when I was nine years old, I remember my parents, you know, my dad being a big entrepreneur and traveling around the world for business as well as pleasure trips with my mom and um, his friends. He went on a world tour and he came back in 1971 um, with a lot of stuff from uh, United States and other parts of the world. But he brought me a very special gift and it was a Mickey Mouse watch. And I was so excited because it has yellow straps and the way my mom was explaining, uh, you know, her journey and, you know, this incredible woman, of mother of six girls. And then she bought everything, one of everything for each daughter. And then she's explaining and she then turned around and she said, I brought you this and it's a watch. And when she spoke about this, I was like, I need to go to this uh, fairyland called United States of America because that's where I wanna be. So you can imagine from nine years old, I was dreaming about coming to this country. And that's a very um, heartfelt childhood memory that I have uh, from 1970s. So Genty, you are one of, of how many siblings? 
we are six girls okay. in a country where women are considered secondary and I'm number five, the lucky one. <laughs> so I'm the oldest of four girls, so I can relate. Okay. <laughs> so, so Genti, you mentioned that um, your dad brought this gift back from you, which was a watch, and that kind of inspired you to learn a more, more about the United States and some of the things that were possible for you. When did you realize that having a career was not an option for you? Oh, right from the get-go, because we came from a pretty affluent family, and um, first of all, one person worked and the entire family was supported even in the middle class and coming from a wealthy um, upper class family and the, the culturally women didn't work th during those times. And even if you had your own business, we didn't go into business and the men took care of most of it. So having a career was not even an option right from the get go. And even to this day, among all the six siblings, I'm the only one who actually works for a living. So all of them are independently on their own uh, with their families and um, living their lives. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think that's kind of hard for some of us to even process or understand. I was raised in a family where we were told from a very young age that we can do and be anything. We were encouraged to go to school and, and have as big of careers as we wanted. So the idea that as a small child, you were raised to not ever think about working or have a, having a career is a, a big mind shift for a lot of us in, in, the, um, in the room today. Yeah. So, one of the, the other things, Genti, that I think is really interesting about your story is you mentioned you, you grew up in a really wealthy family, which is mm -hmm. it's not common also. So how did you know you were so wealthy as a child and why did the, this wealth actually make your life so difficult? You know, the word wealth, wealthy, was not in our vocabulary. We just lived, you know, the colonial British way of living if you did make it, and my dad was, um, you know, was educated in England, and he was an entrepreneur working for the British, and then he started his own company. So he emulated a lifestyle of living that the life of how the British brought stuff to India. So ra rather than talking about whether we were wealthy or not, we lived a lifestyle where, um, you know, it's um, it went without saying that you follow certain rules and regulations, like at the family, you lead a very protected life, very secluded life. And then you didn't go out of the house on your own. You were chaperoned everywhere. So, but then when I, I went to a very good Christian school, a convent, but also always the nuns used to ask this question, hey, can I borrow your chauffeur and uh, your car? to go run our errands because they didn't have any of these vehicles. So it's only at that time when we were asked favors and stuff, we never thought about uh, we were wealthy. However, when I came to this country and I realized, damn, I was one of those wealthy <laughs> family members. I wish I had done certain things to understand that. I didn't realize I had it so good, you know, because I'd never made my bed or a coffee or anything ever in my life until I was 21 years old and I came to this country. So, and we had 14, some 15 people working for us. And I didn't even take, I, I didn't even have my own showers. I had, I had a nanny give me a bath every day until I was 18 years old. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> So Genti, I'm not going to lie. I wouldn't mind having a chef <laughs> cooking, all my, cooking all my meals for me. I have, we had one for 40 years, believe it or not. I was just like a family member. So, oh. yeah. so Genti, you mentioned you went to a Christian school and were educated by nuns. What was one of the most important things you learned from going to that school? You know, the British discipline and uh, hard work. And yeah, I was very fortunate work, coming from a country where Hinduism is very big a religion and having a very um, broad view of my family, allowing us to have any type of, follow any type of religion and not focusing only on what we follow at home was very, very helpful. So we had the best of both worlds and uh, following the, uh, the um, British 
schooling system with the Indian background was a win-win for us. You know. So even though the, you were not able to pursue a career and, and maybe choose your own husband, your family was open-minded when it came to religion. Yeah, so we, it was an English medium school. So even when I was in India and 14 different languages are spoken, I actually went to a, uh, from kindergarten to an English medium school and actually learned uh, to read and write English from the British um, um, nuns and teachers, which was very um, helpful for us to come to a foreign country and survive, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. What, what would you say is your most difficult childhood experience that you look back and you're actually really thankful for today? It, taught you something that became a really important life lesson? You know, there was a curse of being in that affluent lifestyle because we, we had to live for society and everything we did, especially girls, right? Boys got away with a lot of stuff, but girls, you know, if you had a bad name, then the family's name came down. So everything was so restrictive and, and, and uh, so prohibitive that Everything, especially with somebody like me with having a free mind, asking questions was wrong. So I feel very restricted. And I, at nine years old to feel that way, you know, I, it was almost like, um, I don't want to you know, say God or nature. I, th I guess got thrown into a country where I didn't belong, <laughs> I felt like. And, but then I, looking back now, I feel really, really fortunate because I love the Indian culture. Uh, except for that arranged marriage that was forced on me, everything else, uh, I, I'm look, I look back with a lot of pride and um, um, happy that I had that lifestyle and grew up in that uh, environment because it shaped me for who I am today. Yeah, Genti, one of the things that I admire most about you is your curiosity. You always yeah. want to know why and, and know more. And I can't imagine you as a child being so curious and not being able to ask questions and explore and, and do the things that excited you. Yeah, you know, I was just talking to my sister over the phone last week and I was saying, we were talking about our family and I said, remember this one event where in front of the whole group, I asked my mom, mom, did you choose your own husband? And I was like 10, 12 years old. And my mom just almost was so angry. And she was ready to like slap me right there and say, what the hell are you talking about? And because her mother-in-law was there, which is my grandma. And that was like the most offensive thing that I said, but you know, it came naturally to me. And uh, so you can imagine that, that asking that question back in the seventies, right? Is, I mean, not leave it on 2020s, but in the, in the seventies. So. Well, and I think the, your curiosity is one of the things that I think has, has helped you be so successful in your procurement career because yeah. you're always wanting to know more and, and understand things at a deeper level. Oh, yeah. And, you know, it, whatever you touch in any aspect of your life, that's procurement, right? I mean, whether it's uh, medical or technology or facilities or anything. So it's very interesting. And actually, actually that profession sought me out. So I, I think I'm very lucky to be that, that it uh, was my career for the last 30 years. So you went to a Christian school. Um, you were taught by nuns and then you went to college. What did you do after college? So um, being number five in the family, I knew one by one right after school. Uh, and as soon as you finish college, you're gonna go get in line to have that arranged marriage. Like a couple of my sisters got married when they were 16, a couple of them 18 and I was 19. So I was like, oh my God, my time's coming. <laughs> I'd rather <laughs> keep <laughs> I, I'm 37 and I'm not married, so I, I can't even imagine. Being yeah, married so so um, so there was that, you know, and actually I was actually playing a golf tournament in a, in a different part of the country. And I was actually leading when I got called to say, you need to come because there's a family coming to um, to to talk to us to see if that could be a good alliance. This is how it, it happened. You know, there may be many Indians watching or listening to this podcast, I mean, this uh, interview later. Everybody's life's is different. This is about my life and about my family and my experience, right? So I was like so upset and pissed off and I tried to say things in a different way. And my mom's calling me and saying, 
you know, uh, you have to you have to stop. I said, Mom, I'm leading the golf tournament. I cannot leave. And she said, you will. So I flew back and I was so freaking pissed. So I was going to tell this guy, hey, going to tell no, because I want to work and I want to golf and I want to have my own travel agency and stuff. Because my parents traveled, I wanted to have a travel agency. I didn't know how else I could travel, right? So anyway, so I came and I had an 11 month engagement and I was, I was in my third year of college. And then the, the wedding was fixed for the following year when I finished college. And it was the most dreadful time, but I had to go through it. And that, you know, so, talking so about having a voice, right? So Genty, how I, I, I don't know a lot about this process. So how does this even work? So your, your parents set up this initial meeting and then they decide that they want you guys to get married and that's it? Yeah, so it, there's a, uh, I'm talking about my life again, you know, because this different cultures have different, um, you know, um, practices. So I don't want to be um, offending anybody, but that's my life. Yes, you go in a cultural, in a, the caste system is very prevalent. So you have to be in the same caste. And also you have to have the same socioeconomic factors. Like you, if my dad was wealthy, then you look for somebody in that same social class and the wealth class. So you can uh, meet and have that same type of life. All that was great. We were the same caste. We were the same type of a uh, financial background, even though my father was much higher, but the company that they had and all of the stuff seemed to be in a category that seemed to be okay for my family. But the upbringing and the lifestyle that I led where my dad was so progressive in every other way uh, to taking me around the world and giving me a good education and opening up to sports and all these other activities. But then finding a family that was the most opposite, most you know, um, strict in the Indian culture, cannot wear any other outfits but the saris and you can't even call your spouse by your name and uh, you can't travel, you, it's, it's, it's complete, I can't explain, but it was really horrible. But I, even people ask my family, hey, how are you going to match this? Because this girl seems to be like a spitfire. And then, but so you know what somebody said? Well, this is what she earns. She, this is what she gets for being a spitfire. She has to go to a place where she has to adjust and live. <laughs> how about that, Genty, Sarah? Genty, what's a, what, what it, a, a safari, is that what you said? A sorry, a sorry. You know, the, the sorry is the Indian uh, outfit that you wear. That's a, yeah, that it's a common um, costume for our country. But even though there's so many other varieties right now, when I grew up, that was the most prevalent one that everybody wore, yeah, the women wore. So, so you, your family had this meeting and then it was decided you had yeah. this 11 month engagement mm -hmm. and then you married a man that you had no say and in and didn't really know at all. Correct, at 19. And 20, I got married. I had that arranged man, a wedding. Okay. And that happened after you graduated. Correct. So how did this arranged marriage get you to the United States? I, I'm always a big believer in looking at the silver linings and in all the struggles and challenges, good things can come from it. So yeah. how did it get you here to America? So the, the reason I just didn't, get up and leave and come to the U.S. because it's hard to, without any visa to come and live in a foreign country, right? Uh, 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 at that point in time, the person who was arranged to be, you know, my my spouse, it makes me, gives me jitters to call them my husband. <laughs> so, um, uh, actually, he had, he was a student and uh, had a visa here. So, I came as the spouse of a uh, foreign student and then I came here back in when I was 21 years old, and but with the mindset that I need to find my freedom when I, as soon as I got here. Yeah. So. so you were here on a travel visa with with the intent that you were wanting to stay here. I actually came here as a um, as a, on a visa that is supported as a as a, a spouse of a student. Okay. And then that could change to any other category as you applied into in the United States. Yes. Okay. 
how how did you find the courage to get out of this marriage and leave your family, your wealth, basically everything you knew and start over in your 20s? You know, it's hard because when I talk to my sisters, I don't think any one of them would have done what I did because they like that luxurious lifestyle and they didn't they were accommodative of the culture because they didn't they didn't think it was that bad. But for me, it was so it's it it um the loss of my independence was so great that the privilege of the privileged lifestyle and the resources that I had didn't mean anything to me and giving all of that up for my independence was a struggle for my victory to owning my life right and even when I didn't have anything I came here with 30 bucks in my hand and when you lead an affluent lifestyle you don't realize uh, you know that 30 bucks doesn't get you far because I didn't even think and then I on the plane I spent $17 getting my headphones and I forgot that I have to save my money so so it's a different so my totally right brain um, phase of my life got me here and then suddenly when I came to this country then my left brain was in full full function to say gosh I have to survive how do I survive this? But every day was an adventure. Every day was an adventure. I used to look at the calendar and say, day one, I'm in the US. Day two, at 36 years later, I'm still counting. I love this country. I love this country. I love the people. Yay for the Bay Area. Way to represent. Yes. <laughs> so, so, you, so you got out of this arranged marriage, which is not easy to do from what I understand, and you had no money and, and nothing. So what's the process for immigrants getting acclimated into the U.S.? Yeah, so um, yeah, it took me seven years, by the way, to have everything, you know, and for those seven years, I just focused on myself. And um, basically, when you apply for a visa, it takes, it takes a while. And it, um, it, it, you know, I, I heard recently from a couple of friends of mine, it takes about 10, 15 years to get a visa, uh, a green card. Fortunately, those days in the 80s, it took me like a couple of years, but I actually, until I got the rights visa status, I could not work for pay. So I actually uh, looked up the yellow pages and decided, hey, you know what? I want to work somewhere for free so I can, you know, beef up my skills and when it's ready for me to uh, get employed somewhere else, you know, somewhere, then it'll be a right time for me to um, get going. And, you know, a couple of my siblings who were in India, they helped me greatly with the, the mental um, strain that I had to go through, I became very anorexic at some point. And um, uh, because I was denounced for whatever I did back home. And even though you're millions of miles away, you care, and that also shows your personality. I love my family, I love the society, but what I did, I, I, I hurt myself more than I did anybody else, and that took a big toll on my health, but at the same time, the friendship uh, that I built here and the, the stuff that I got excited that it's my life, my decisions, my choice, and if I screwed up, I don't have anybody to blame but myself, Give me the courage to keep it moving forward. Yeah. So Genti, how did you live without earning an income? Like financially, I mean, we live in the Bay Area. This is, it's a very expensive place. Like what did you do to survive? Sarah bought groceries for 20 bucks a month. Coming from a place where I had 14, you know, I'm, words that we don't use today as helpers, but servants, they call them in India and the colonial British, British rule. But I never cared about any of the stuff, except I, I just, I, it, my health got really affected. But at the end, my dad and through my siblings sent some money in some way. And um, I just lived. I just lived, I forgot golf. I, I, I brought the same old clothes that I had back in India and I wore that for like five, six years, didn't buy anything, but I did work. <laughs> I did, and somebody said, hey, Gente has such a spark and I had all that energy. So coming to this country and having that independence gave me everything that's free spirit and I could forsake anything and everything for that, including my love for golf, you know, so. 
And and you mentioned you you struggled with anorexia, eating disorders, or something that lots of people struggle with. How did you get over that? I mean, it's something I'm sure you still live with today. It never just goes away. But how did you overcome the anorexia and just kind of move on to the next phase in your life? You know, um, I tried to go to many doctors and nobody helped. My hair started falling out. And suddenly when my hair started falling out, I was like, oh my God, I got to take care of this myself. And um, I think I went to Stanford Hospital and they got, gave me some uh, type of uh, help there that was very, um, I, I think I was able to look within to say why and ask some questions as to why. And, you know, it's easy to talk about a lifestyle change, but I didn't, even though I was excited to be here and stuff, I think my body, my physical body was going through a different type of a uh, shock that I had to adjust and live and um, I got better. Yeah, I got better. Yeah, that's, it's really amazing because there's a lot of people that struggle with that forever and it, yeah. it just has a huge yeah. impact on everything that they do. So yeah. kudos to you for finding the will to, to overcome that with, with no support. I mean, you were yeah. here completely on your own and, and didn't know anyone. So Gente, I want to, I want to talk a little bit about now how you got your first job. So mm -hmm. You didn't go to school in the United States, so you had no U.S. college degree, and you couldn't work for a while because you didn't have your green card, and you mentioned you started volunteering. How did this volunteer work help you get a paying job? So, um, you know, back in the 80s, which there was internet or social media, we just did, had the Thomas Register for procurement and the yellow pages for finding... <laughs> finding suppliers, right? So I looked up the yellow pages and there was city of Sunnyvale and it says it had a volunteer office. So I called them and I said, I'd like to volunteer. They said, the volunteering is for court referrals, you know, uh, where you, if you're a juvenile and you had uh, some offense, you have to do some time. So I said, well, I, it's not that I committed any crime. I wanna work in a volunteer office and I wanna volunteer. So they, I had an interview with the volunteer office and they said, how many hours do you wanna work? Uh, an hour a week or so? I said, no, full time, I wanna work 40 hours. <laughs> you're, like, you're like the dream, right? To come in <laughs> yeah. and wanna volunteer full time. Yeah, so then I started working and then I, uh, you know, I, look, this is this is new coming from a wealthy family, and then uh, going to school and college, playing golf, and then suddenly I'm in. But everything was so exciting. I started answering phones, and man, the typing was tough because I couldn't type more than five words a minute, <laughs> so it was hard. So I said, okay, first things first, I should, I will never get a job where I have to type. <laughs> so I have to use my brain rather than sit and type, right? So I, then I started working and then they were like, all these people around me were like, hey, this, this girl has a lot of spunk, you know, and uh, I don't know why she's working. So I had to explain to them about the, you know, usually you don't see immigrants in government administration. Usually they're engineers or software engineers and lawyers or doctors and stuff. So I'm telling them these stories and stuff. So um, within this, um, when I got the opportunity, I started working as a full-time volunteer almost thousand to two thousand hours a year and I worked for three years that way and I worked at the uh, city manager's office the mayor's office then I worked in um, HR and then from there I went to the police department and sometimes I used to work in the police department after I worked in the HR after 5 p.m and so I was like everybody's like you know there's something about her that she's very willing and she's hardworking. And very committed. And so, Jensi, how many hours? You said three years working full time. How many hours did you rack up of volunteer work? Probably thousand, three, four thousand hours. Probably, yeah, yeah. Hey, but it got me a job without typing a resume. Everybody knew Jensi, and I, my very first paid job was in the. Um, Actually, when I got my green card in 87, was in HR. I was the HR liaison to get all the applicants for the jobs and stuff. And let me tell you, you have in the civil service rules, you have to pass the test 
for um, uh, for going to the next step. You have to have the written uh, typing test and from the typing test to a written exam um, for grammar and all stuff. And then you go for the interviews. And I was like, I can't pass the first hurdle because I can't type. What do I do? So guess what I did? I was a proctor for the for all of the tests in the HR department. And I took that sheet of paper and I memorized it. So when it was time for me to take the test, I typed 55 words a minute because I did it with my two fingers. And little did I know, I was typing with my, my finger, middle finger. And when I was in the Sunnyvale police, when somebody used to come and ask for help at the front desk, I would say, one minute, please. You see what I'm doing? <laughs> you're, you're what I call a keyboard hack. Exactly. People that just kind of plunk on the keyboard. Yeah, but guess guess what I was thinking? I was flipping off everybody. <laughs> <laughs> One minute, please. Uh, let me. <laughs> so then I was making everybody angry, and I was like, "Why is I, why are everybody coming to the police department angry with me?" Then somebody said, "Gentle, you're flipping everybody off." I said, "What's flipping me?" <laughs> this is how I learned. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that is hilarious. So, so you're, you're, you figured out very creative and strategic about memorizing it. So you passed the test and then, so you had this paying HR job. How did that turn into getting into procurement? So from there, um, in the evenings after working a full time, I went to work at the, uh, Sunnyvale police and I was doing all the fingerprint cards, typing up the fingerprint cards for all those people who, who were arrested. So nobody wanted to do the job, no paid employee wanted to do it. So I said, okay, I'll do it. So the lady was like, wow, would you like to get paid? I said, yes. So I actually negotiated a 25% raise right there from HR and I told HR I'm leaving, I'm going to Sunnyvale police to work. Because hey. when I asked her for a pay increase, she wouldn't give it to me. She's like, you know, you just started, Genty. I'm like, okay. So I, mean, so I got a full-time job, uh, paid full-time job at the Sunnyvale police. And it was uh, something that I could do very well. And then from there, a uh, couple of years later, that's when I was anorexic. I was working, working and a lot of stuff and a lot of things that I had to also take care of my health and stuff. So I decided I would just go and uh, work in the Sunnyvale library. I got a promotion there. So I was actually in charge of all the library acquisitions, um, procuring all the books and uh, uh, periodicals and the shelving and all of the stuff. So that's where my procurement career began uh, in acquisitions acquiring books and periodicals and audiovisual materials. And that's where I met my husband you, too. You have, a, you have a print background. Oh, yes. <laughs> I think you're, you're the only person I've known that's gotten into the procurement industry through the library. So yes, yes, very yes. interesting story. Yeah. And yeah. you learned how to negotiate your raise. So you oh, were, you were well on your way. Oh, you bet. <laughs> So you're working in the library, what next? Okay, so um, so the library, we had a, um, they decided to close the library because they had to renovate it. And they told everybody, hey, uh, if you'd like to take some time off, um, this is a perfect time. And if a few of us, uh, you'd like to work part-time, we're gonna have a relocation. So I decided, hey, let's have, I was telling my husband, okay, now it's a perfect time to have a child. Let's go plan to start, have our second child. Little did I know that I was going to be the acquisition queen of buying all the materials, the shelving and all of the stuff. So, um, so when in 1998 uh, was when I was really uh, interested in advancing my procurement career. And the, the procurement director was watching everything that was happening. And I was doing a kick-ass job as a procurement liaison, not even in the finance department. So uh, she said, you know, you would make a great buyer. And that's when I asked how soon said, you ask the right questions and you have the energy and um, you tackle all of the functions and you ask the right questions, in, including for AP, uh, the accounts payable department. So she opened up a recruitment and of course there I was and I applied for the job and I actually got the acquisition um, buyer role in the city of Sunnyvale. And you mentioned your husband. So this this was a marriage of choice? Oh, yes, of course. 
And of course, I had to do everything opposite. So um, I actually, my husband was actually a student in um, uh, sunny city of Sunnyvale, and he was going to school in San Jose State. And we were friends for quite a few years and uh, we fell in love. And um, of course, this is a six feet, five inches Dutch. Uh, it's very different from our Indian culture, but um, yep, I'm, I'm happily married 27 years. And you mentioned he's in photography? Yes, he went to school in photography. Talk about uh, going from a cast where you are an industrialist to finding somebody you love and <laughs> doing what they choose to do, right? Yep, and um, he's working for Stanford right now. He's a property manager. And we have some amazing pictures of our kids as they grow up. And some of my pictures when I was uh, in my 20s too and 30s, yeah. Beautiful, and I, you shared some of the photos from your wedding. Um, very, very beautiful, and I'm happy that you guys found each other and you were able to to find someone that you wanted to spend your life with. Thank you. So you got this buyer role. Somebody saw something in you. You applied for a job, and, and you were selected. That is a far cry from being a chief procurement officer. So, how in the world did you get to be a CPO? Yeah, so um, when I was a buyer, my boss gave me some of the most important assignments because I always went and knocked on a door saying, give me more, give me more work, right? So when back in the 90s, when e-procurement just evolved, mm -hmm. she put me in charge of learning how to uh, automate some of the uh, the contracts that we had and also negotiate with suppliers to do, have a punch out uh, of their own website and Granger and Office Depot types, right? And, and, also, and at that time, you know, punch out is super common today, API integrations, but at that time, that was a big thing. Yes. In fact, I have some newspaper articles that show that Genty Van der Tag negotiated with Granger to have a 15% discount on online catalogs. And then we used to also even order rubber stamps on our, you know, that everything has to be funneled because they would have uh, all these stamps and stuff. So I was like, oh my God, this is, I need to find some solution to this. So my boss called me in and said, well, let's do an e-procurement study. We'll, we'll bring one of the big fours to do the study. So I was in charge of this as a junior buyer. Uh, to actually work with Deloitte to do the analysis because we were a big um, KPMG, Pete Marwick financial system uh, operation in city of Sunnyvale. And we brought Deloitte in and we did the entire study. I still have the study from 2000. And at that time, she also sent me to uh, conferences and I went to a conference where I met many met number of CEOs and I actually signed up city of Sunnyvale for an e-procurement, uh, e-print solution with a company called impress.com. And a month later, I actually got an offer from them, unbelievable offer um, uh, that, to come and work as a sales operations manager. And I went, run, I went running to my boss to say, what do I do? And she says, go try it out. If it doesn't work out, you can come back to me, back again. And that was the, the most amazing thing. I, w I went there. But I realized I was not a sale in sales or I was not happy. We blew like $200 million, but I learned something. I had the most amazing boss again, another new boss. And she was like a machine. She was so fast. She was so quick. I learned a lot from her. And then when the company closed down during the dot-com uh, crisis, I decided I need to move on. But I didn't want to go back to the city of Sunnyvale. I actually... Uh, applied at Cisco to be a, um, I want to go back to the, I want to go to the private sector to um, expand my, you know, breadth of uh, procurement activities. But that's the time when everybody put a freeze and then I became a contractor and then I worked at County of Santa Clara where there was a huge need for um, uh, procurement staff. And that's when I joined back in 2000. Genty, you, you mentioned you didn't like sales, why? You know, I like the power of money in my hands. <laughs> I don't like to sell. <laughs> I got so I've got so many offers, you know, because I, I I negotiated so many. I mean, I'm not kidding. My very first contract that I negotiated was County of Santa Clara. I saved seven hundred fifty thousand dollars, and nobody had even the word negotiation was not there in the vocabulary or in in the history of procurement, right? 
And the second contract I had, I saved $12 million. So, you know, uh, uh, that was the electronic voting system back there. So it's not like I just suddenly got all promoted. Anything I touched in the County of Santa Clara, uh, nobody wanted to do anything. And I had this, you know, energy and the curiosity and also the perseverance to do the toughest thing. And then the biggest problem for me was I then couldn't type, man. So I used to go after night after putting the kids to sleep, I used to go finish typing up all of the stuff because I was able to think faster than my typing, right? So um, I worked some very, very long hours and I did some massive projects. You know, they had hired KPMG back in, um, and I think, 1999 or 2000 to do, do a business process re-engineering. And they did some amazing study to say, here are the quick wins and here's the long midterm and long-term solutions. So naturally by way of me working, they put all of the quick wins on, on my lap to say, Genty, we're gonna make you responsible for this. And, um, and I ran with it. I actually ran the procurement card system from scratch. I was scared of public speaking. Actually, they, I found a coach to teach me how to get over the fear of public speaking and all of the stuff. And then I actually started doing IT acquisitions. Then I did the toughest and the largest uh, acquisitions and the customers started loving me and I got the highest rating of customer um, uh, surveys, um, satisfaction survey. So that got, gave me some confidence. I'm like, hey, I'm doing something right. Uh, so let's keep going. And then also I had um, Mark and myself had two kids and the, our decision was to send them to private school and I know we had to work hard for a living. Yeah, work hard for a living. <laughs> so Genty, it seems like in, in everything that you just talked about that you always have been really drawn to the technology part of procurement, the yes. automation, the efficiency piece. So I, I want to dive into that a little bit, but how did you get the head of procurement or chief procurement officer job? So there are so many people in the industry yeah. and there are not a lot of those types of positions, let alone being a woman, yeah. being an immigrant, English is not your first language. We, right. We've established that you were a keyboard plunker. So yeah. how did you get this job and, and what advice do you have for other people who have aspirations of having really big procurement jobs and they just don't know how to get there? Yeah, so in public sector, you know, the civil service rules, you have to have these many years of experience. You should have this type of education. You have this pre-qualification, which is not so in the private sector, right? So um, when the job, when my boss, I had a boss who was there for two years and then she moved to work for the state of California for Arnold Schwarzenegger. So I decided, okay, um, I need to work for somebody exactly like the boss I had in the past. You know, I had two great bosses, one at City of Sunnyvale and one at Impress, that e-print company. So I, I contacted my boss from City of Sunnyvale to apply for the job and says, boss, you need to come be my boss. So we can do big, big things. And there's a lot of money here in the City of Santa Clara, a City of Sunnyvale was 80 million probably. And here is like $2 billion, right? So the, the, the complexity was, large and, um, and huge enough to have somebody with a lot of experience. So she applied for the job too. And when I was talking to other people, somebody said, Chinti, why don't you apply? Every, what a few customers contacted me and said, you'll make a great, uh, I said, I don't have the experience in the leadership and also all of these commodities. So I said, hey, what the hell, let me apply. Because when I did that, I got called by the uh, Genentech, which is the company, biotechnology company. Uh, one of our uh, chief information officers was our VP at Genentech. And he and I hit it off really well in the county of Santa Clara when he was there. So he had in, asked me to apply for the job and uh, an opportunity to work for him. And then my boss who went to the state was saying, Genty, do you want to come to the state? Because we can open up another position there and you could be the number two. So I was like, hey, what is this? Everybody's calling me, but uh, why not take a chance? And I applied for the job. Right, and I got rejected actually because I didn't have the uh, years of experience. And Genty, when you say you applied for the job, what job did you apply for? I applied for the head of procurement. You know that the title called chief procurement officer is relatively new in the yeah. public sector, so it's they either call it as a department head or head of 
procurement or purchasing manager or some other stuff, right? So they even changed the name from purchasing to procurement in the county of Santa Clara, trying to attract the right people and stuff. So uh, there's a lot of people who applied all around different parts of the United States, as well as local, locally in Santa Clara. And um, I got rejected in the first attempt to say I didn't have enough years of experience. So I wrote a three page letter and I wrote all the $300 million worth of transaction activities I, I was managing as an IT procurement manager for the last two years and how successful I was and I saved the money. And uh, I attached all of the customer survey uh, satisfaction results. And I submitted and I said, give me an opportunity to at least interview. So I interviewed and they brought out interview panelists from outside of the county of Santa Clara. And actually I was like the top five uh, candidates. And, um, and then when the, during the final interview, I actually was the top three and then I got offered the position. So you went from nothing, right? Being at the very bottom of the stack to being in the top five by advocating for yourself. Yes, of course, yes. And, and then, I did get a lot of help. I, you know, there's a couple of things. One, I don't have a fear of, I don't know, what do I do? I don't have pride and ego. So I was able to ask. So I actually called my previous bosses and asked them, hey, I want to apply for this job. I've not, I've typed a couple of resumes in my life, right? I don't have the experience. Can you help me? So she actually gave me a, something called the skill builder. And somebody from Genentech actually helped and somebody I don't even know who it is, but by word of mouth, people were asking. And then I also had the probably the confidence because I, I was sought after in a couple of other places too, which is big positions, not small, yeah. right? So then I had to choose, do I drive with two small children all the way from uh, San Jose to South San Francisco or to relocate to San, Sacra, Sacramento or should I take this job, right? So I had options. So what was your first day like being a, a head of procurement or chief procurement officer? I mean, that must, it would have freaked me out. I would have been super overwhelmed. Well, let me tell you, it, it was exciting and it was very, very tough because I already had worked in a way that County of Santa Clara was not used to was because I executed 100% of the time. And uh, effort without execution is okay in certain parts of uh, the public sector. And that was never the way it was in the city of Sunnyvale or in my father's companies, right? And then the second thing is um, I, uh, by way of promotion, I, I was the head of the people who I was reporting to, right? That was very, very tough. So uh, suddenly I'm sitting at the top, but at the same time, I had this drive and um, I, I, I don't have the full leadership skills that um, come with this position that is required, but I knew I was able, I did not have any doubt about my technical abilities at all because I had done all of this stuff, even when I didn't have to work for a, uh, for a pay, for a living, you know. So Jenti, one of the things that comes to mind for me, I have several friends who work in the public sector, run companies that, that really focus on that segment. There's a big stigma, at least um, here in the Bay Area and, and in a lot of the people that I interact with, that people who are in government um, are lazy, they're underachievers, they are not innovative. They're just there because they want a pension. So how did you overcome this and motivate people who weren't necessarily of a corporate mindset and focused on, you know, being really driven and wanting to make all of these changes? Yeah, it's very sad that people have that uh, opinion, you know, especially you know, where I'm consulting right now, you know, there's a big tug of war between the public sector and, uh, and the public private partnership. Um, it's unfair for the people who work because uh, in most of these organization, uh, especially like the size of the county of Santa Clara is very heavily unionized. But I learned a couple of things. One is, uh, it's a different mindset of how to spend taxpayers money and move that forward. And also uh, in a culture where there was no performance evaluations, 
Uh, you get paid based on a scale of step one through five. You have specific service rules where you just apply for jobs. And here I'm a poster child and I'm coming in, I'm coming to this, uh, to this uh, county and I'm saying, sorry, a buyer classification in County of Santa Clara is under clerical administrative. You, uh, they look at us as typing six part forms. And here I have done quite a few as a journey level procurement contractor, as well as a procurement manager. And I'm advocating hiring people, uh, not in the union, but in the management association type of classification. So actually when I did that, there was a lot of um, tension and staff stood in front of the board and said not to support me. And I had to learn myself. It's like, uh, am I gonna push myself to uh, get negative feedback from everybody all the time? So a uh, couple of things, what I had to do, and it was a very tough situation for me was I had to get a coach to sort of learn myself first, why, how to lead without fear of um, failure. And the second situation is how do I do it in a way that I take care of the organization first and uphold the vision and mission of the and values of the organization. So uh, when it came to the union environment, I actually learned uh, to partner with the union steward. And I got to tell you as a story, uh, I, I did most of the heavy lifting uh, because I had to, procurement was called a black eye of County of Santa Clara in my department. And, and the HR was one. And I, so I, I'm an overachiever and in charge and there's no established uh, performance protocols and you got to do this. And so nobody told me to work like this. In fact, if I had worked less, I would have been more, more even more successful, right? But I didn't want to take the job where I had to do, do that type of a change in my personality. So I had to learn the lot, a hard way. I brought in some consultants, which was, a, I think the, the most horrible thing I did, even though I'm a consultant right now, because their end was just to finish the project and move on. They didn't really care versus having that type of a connection with the people. So I had to learn the hard way. And that's when I learned a lot through my coach who was not judgmental. And he actually brought out the seven habits of a highly effective people and the eighth habit, which is finding a voice and teaching me to understand myself. And while, I, but I got to tell you in 2008, I went to India for a big wedding, my nephew's wedding. And in, it was an arranged marriage, but with 5,000 people, you could talk about Hollywood, okay? This is this 60, I don't know how, there's so much wealth. You didn't have to work. So I'm sitting there and I'm with my Blackberry and I'm working and somebody comes and says, so, um, so what's your product? And I'm like, product? Uh, I didn't fit in there because I'm now an American, you know? <laughs> and I said, uh, no, I'm working. I don't work. I don't have any. She said, which company do you own? I said, I don't own any company. I work for a government. They're like, you're sitting at a wedding and you're typing up and you work for the government. That's the most derogatory role that you could have working for government in India. <laughs> So I'm like, no, I have a sense of, um, you know, I have a need, uh, my, my staff are contacting me, but I noticed something, I had to answer every question, people were not able to do that work on their own, because they wanted somebody to make those decisions, right. And when I was there, my daughter was in the fifth grade, and she was flying back because she was going to a new private school, and she wanted to uh, run for student council as a head of council student council. So I'm trying to pacify her. Hey, you're going to the new school. Don't worry about it. You know, if you don't, if you lose out, and mom's going to stay behind and I'm pacifying and she goes, so she calls me from US to India when I'm there at 3 a.m. in the morning because of the time difference. And she says, mom, I won. And I said, how the hell did you win? And she says, I'll tell you, mom, when I was in India for two weeks for the wedding, I actually recruited all the first graders. I got them all from Michael's store. I got them all the stuff and they went and distributed all over the school. And I made them all do all the work. And I actually uh, recruited the best people, the first graders, and I talked to them. And when I went back up to two weeks, my name and the flyers were everywhere. And actually I won and I'm the head of student council. I was <laughs> of a brand new school. So I said, oh my God, my fifth, my, my daughter who's in the fifth grade in a brand new school has taught me something. 
I need to find the stars in my own team and lean on them. And one of the stars was the union steward who cared so deeply about the people. I cared deeply about the people. And we joined our hands together to say, I will support you in any way. And if you can help me. So she was like my right hand changing policy and stuff. And that grew, that was my, my, my um, journey of being a journey level CPO from um, being a novice to being effective. And in 17 years, it took me 17 years to handle the people process and then implement technology. And then I um, finished my career when I hit 55. It's a nutshell, but it was a lot of pain and but a lot of um, effort, but uh, many, many rewards. So Genty, we have about four minutes left. So I, I wanna ask one final question about your time as a CPO, and then I wanna do kind of a spitfire round um, to yeah. get your, your feedback on a, a, few, uh, a few things. So yeah. what are you most proud of in your 17 years as a CPO? What accomplishment or what thing that you did you do that you feel um, best about? <laughs> You know, among many, many things, based on what we are talking today, the first thing is my desire to live my life and do what thing I did best allowed me to expand my department and contribute to society in a way that 50 families benefited because my department grew 308%. That means I supported 50 families, giving them opportunities. And at the same time, I took care of the taxpayers' monies wisely and contributed to society. In a, and it was so fulfilling for me to serve um, in a capacity as a public servant. Yeah. And then you, you turned 55 and you decided to, I'm gonna say in quotes, retire. Yes. Um, why did you choose to retire and what are you doing now? So, um, you know, all of the success doesn't come without some other consequences, right? So somewhere with my health and my family was taking a um, second and third um, choices in my life, which was not detrimental to our, the Van der Tyke family and my health. So I thought this was a perfect time for me to segue in and take a break and smell the roses, go around the world, travel and stuff and spend time with the family and um, recoup a little bit. So that's what I did. But uh, I did a lot of traveling for one year after I retired. And then I started teaching at UC Santa Cruz Silicon Valley Extension. And at that time, my, my daughters were like, mom, especially my younger one was like, what were you when we needed you? You know, but now I have my life. Are you bothering me too many times a day? <laughs> I said, I want to be there for you. She's like, that's good. The, you know, leave me alone when I uh, let me come back to you. So, you know, I had to get back into the working world a little bit. And um, I got called to work for the San Francisco 49ers as a consultant. And that's where I'm working for right now, so a year and a half that I've been uh, so excited to work for a, an, a another amazing boss and some incredible people at the 49ers. And I'm helping them transform the procurement operations. So Genty, in honor of your new employer, I am rocking my number uh, 10 Jimmy <laughs> Garoppolo jersey. So hands down, hottest quarterback ever in the NFL. And I'm obsessed with watching the 49ers because of him. So I'm wishing him a, a very speedy recovery. I, I know he got injured, so we, we want him to be back in full force next year. So we have you a got minute. great taste, girl. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have a minute left. I want to do a spitfire round. I'm going to ask you five things. And if you can answer in, uh, in, in one or two words. Yeah. Most unique hobby. Daydreaming. Chore you hate doing the most. Taking the garbage out. <laughs> Favorite book. Awaken the giant within. Most inspirational leader. Keith Kroc, who's a founder of Ariba. And best parenting advice? Don't wait till you retire to take care of family and enjoy time. Yeah. 
All right, Jen T. Well, it's been a pleasure to interview you and tell your story. We are exactly at time. I'm going to turn it back over to Kathy to close out our very first Voice of Supply Chain interview. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you both so much. Oh, and thank you so much, uh, Gentine, for sharing your, your journey. I mean, a personal journey. I hope everybody on the uh, joining us today on this, on this program um, uh, really uh, had some takeaways from um, everything you shared with us today. And I really appreciate you uh, being on our first episode of Voice of Supply Chain. Um, I would like to let everybody also know that uh, to join us on February 24th, as Sarah then interviews Sarah Barnes Humphrey, who is the founder and host of Let's Talk Supply Chain. Of course, I will be emailing out and we will be posting on our social media about this upcoming event. Again, uh, thank you everybody for joining us this afternoon. And I want to thank uh, Sarah and Gentine as well. Have a great Thank day, everybody. You. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.